right? Hello, everybody. Hello. So let's talk about OWASP top 10 security vulnerabilities in Node.js. So let me start by introducing myself, Marco Ippolito from Italy. Uh, I work at Nearform and I'm one of the Node.js collaborators. And generally speaking, I'm open source enthusiast. I like to use this term because I really like uh, talking about open source and security. So what's a WASP? Because a lot of people ask me uh, like why you have a WASP and as the beginning of your title. And like a WASP is one of the most important organizations that try to spread security awareness mm -hmm and improve the web ecosystem and it's actually the acronym for open web application security project it's a non-profit foundation and what they do is totally open source so uh, every year they provide um, rankings for the top 10 most critical web application security so what they do is um, get expert from the field and do surveys to uh, acknowledge which are the most and most common vulnerabilities that uh, web developers have to try to avoid in their projects and the ranking is not based on the like just on the frequency of the vulnerability but also on three main factor which is uh, frequency severity so it means uh, how big of an impact a vulnerability has on your web application and uh, like um, so severity and uh, impact so let's start with the the tenth one which is server-side request forgery uh, this category was added from the community survey and it's basically uh, when your application is fetching some resource some remote resource without validating the user supplied url what does it mean like the most common example is when your web application tries to um, receives a new url imagine like your profile picture so you want the user tries to upload his profile picture to your web application but he supplies something like sneaky trying to access some resources that otherwise wouldn't be accessible because your web application is fetching uh, we use axios in these examples try to fetch a user provide url and this user provide url is malicious so in this example we have localhost 3001 but could be almost everything depending on what the attacker tries to achieve so it could fetch passwords uh, try to look into other services that are not exposed or whatever and how can you uh, uh, what are the remediations for this kind of vulnerabilities first of all never trust user supplied urls so you always have to sanitize the user input and validate it don't never send raw responses to the client because if you send the raw response the client can understand which kind of errors you are getting or you can try to, th to tinker the request to make it to try to access more uh, resources and never ever ever always disable http redirections because the client could try to uh, sneak um, uh, something that looks like a normal url with something malicious and it could redirect to somewhere else that you don't want to so let's go to number nine and this is um, like you will see that these security vulnerabilities are very closely related to each other so if you have one you might have uh, others of you might lack something to uh, realize that you are being hacked so this one is an example of not actually a vulnerability in your code but a lack of something that um, uh, prevents hacker from accessing your or to like to uh, um, react when you are being attacked and security logging and monitoring failures is um, this was also added by the community and it's about um, like we all know that logging and monitoring is very hard for especially big application so often we don't add we don't add logs 
or alert, uh, alarms that allow us to react quickly. So for example, we don't even notice that we are being hacked. And um, like it's important to respond quickly to breaches and uh, hackers attack. So an example of this one is, for example, um, this was actually uh, using Undici, and it was using a vulnerable version, which is 5.0. So um, in, there was in this CVE that basically um, it explained that you could smuggle uh, uh, in the HTTP header content type. You could smuggle another request. So it was basically um, using a vulnerability of the node HTTP parser to um, do an HTTP smuggling attack. So it would perform that call. So your a web application, when received this kind of header, would perform another call. And you would never ever realize this unless you have um, you have proper logging. Like you want to log everything that the, the user has supplied, and you also have enough context to identify which user has supplied something. So, for example, if you logged uh, the content type, and you also had a warn when, for example, uh, someone tries to um, inject something that doesn't look right, we have had like validate content type. So if the content type is not valid, it means someone is trying to do something to your web application and then you want an alarm or you want to react quickly to that. Because if you have a vulnerability, like is in this example, that might be dangerous or you are exposed to all kinds of um, dangers. So let's go to the number eight. Oh wait, remediation. So. You have to, as I said, you have to make sure you always control, like validate all the inputs and log everything that's user supplied and especially like um, important transactions such as failed logins or logins in general and make sure that uh, for uh, logs are in a format that's easy, uh, accessible and can be manipulated by log managers. For example, uh, you have, um, I don't know, like centralized logging system. So usually you want to log uh, in, for example, JSON format, which is accessible to many uh, log managers. And also you, have, you want to have an alerting system. So when you find that someone might be potentially attacking your web application, you can react immediately. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is software data and integrity failures. Um, so this is also like a general uh, concept. For example, you're trying to, um, like your CICD pipeline is insecure. So uh, it's trying to pull malicious code or uh, um, your, C your whole CICD system is compromised. Or for example, you are deserializing um, malicious uh, code. So this is generally speaking when your data that you trust can be tampered by someone. And a big example was this uh, node serialize uh, package that allow you to basically what the JSON parse and JSON stringify does, but it was a uh, third party dependencies. And uh, it contained a vulnerability that allowed an attacker to um, wait, to uh, inject some malicious code into the payload. So when you deserialized, for example, cookies, uh, and an attacker has inject uh, malicious code, you would execute arbitrary code. So an attacker could do anything, could execute any code on your machine, because you, you are you are using uh, insecure. Uh, deserializing library. So how to prevent this? You want to make sure that data is not uh, serialized or tampered and you can do this by signing. Uh, for example, when you download the package, you want to sure that it's signed. You want to calculate the hash of that package to make sure that 
you check the hash and you make sure that is not has been not, has not been modified. Uh, you want to make sure that libraries and dependencies come from trusted repository. Like we tend to download anything from the internet randomly, but that's that's very dangerous. And also, as I said, you need to always check the digital signature to verify that the software has not been altered. And this is something very common and we don't uh, like put a lot of uh, attention into this. Just as like a few days ago, it was, um, it was uh, um, like it was been published that um, a tampered version of Fedora has been distributed for years. And people, it took like people like 10 years to realize that uh, um, package manager was distributing un like unofficial uh, versions of Fedora, for example, because they because people don't check uh, the hash, they don't check the digital signatures, so they just install stuff from the internet. Let's go to next one, and this is, as I told you, is very similar to the ones that ha that happened before. Like they are all interconnected when. You are doing, if you're doing something wrong, you open uh, access to all sorts of vulnerabilities. So this is about identification and, and authentication failures. For example, um, this happens when you cannot identify your user. You cannot, you're not 100% sure that the user is actually who claims to be. So for example, your uh, authentication system is broken or is not secure enough, like you're not using multi-factor authentication, for example, or you allow brute force attack on your logins, uh, or you'd never ask uh, users to rotate their password. So if the password gets leaked, everybody could be impersonating that user because it's on the internet. So like what you want to avoid is that your application looks like this. So we we all know Among Us the game when someone pretends someone is an attacker and it's very hard to identify who the attacker is because the, their identity has been compromised. So how do we prevent this? Use multi-factor authentication. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time and if your application needs um, uh, authentication, there are like hundreds of providers, like it has been already done multiple times, so no need to implement something from scratch. Limit failed logins, like you don't want attackers to perform a brute force on um, a user, so with uh, multiple attempts they could uh, discover the password of someone and you want, uh, you want to limit the failed logins and also as i said before you want alerting like when someone is trying to uh, like it's failing their login multiple times you want an alert you want to know okay something sketchy is going on i want to check and you want to implement weak password check you should never allow weak passwords like um, there was a, um, actually a survey um, a few years ago uh, that and most people use the like password is the most common password in on the internet like people will use uh, their people are lazy so they will use the like the simplest password and you want to prevent that you need to enforce that passwords are strong and also you want to align like uh, your pass password length and complexity with the standard of NIST uh, so it's like uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology and they have guidelines to, m to make sure that you implement your password check correctly. So you don't have to invent a new kind of password checking system. It's everything standardized, you just have to follow the guidelines and, make and the, the guidelines change not very often but they change with time because machines get more powerful and passwords get leaked and so you want to stay up to date with uh, these policies. Next one is vulnerable and updated, outdated components. This is also a very common one and like I like to talk about this because I've been working on Node.js to implement the uh, dependency update automation 
And the whole point is to avoid to use vulnerable and outdated components. So you want to have some kind of system that checks and um, has a workflow to update dependencies. For example, um, like we saw in the example before, we were using an outdated version of Undici, which is 5.8, that contained a vulnerability. And actually, it contained multiple vulnerabilities. This is another one that the same package contained, and you could sneak, um, you could sneak um, uh, into the origin, you could sneak um, another URL, and it would uh, execute another request. So it was very similar to the to the first one, but it it like. Updating dependency is very important. So you want to use tools to monitor the status of your dependencies. There are several tools, and I will talk about it later, uh, about some tools that you can use. Uh, you, also, you also want to automate the de dependency update workflow, and this is what the security team of Node.js has been doing for the, all the dependencies of Node. Like we created a workflow so that every time there is a new release, we open a pull request to um, to add that new release. So even if there is a vulnerability, we are we always are up to date. So every week we check uh, if there are like CVEs or new releases, and we are always up to date. Remove uh, remove unused dependencies. So that's like the reason why we have unused dependencies is because we don't check what our dependencies are. If we automate the like checking dependency versions, we can see that some of them are stale for a long time, or they are not maintained anymore, or we don't really need them. And um, unmaintained dependency means that someone could open a pull request and nobody will review it and probably could sneak some kind of malicious code into it. So you don't want to use um, outdated dependencies, and you also make sure you don't use like uh, dependencies that you don't need for your project. So the tools that we can use to check that our project dependencies are safe and up to date is um, "Is my node vulnerable?" by Raphael. Uh, this is your <laughs> yeah, is a, a great one. So it basically, if you have a dependency with a CVE, it will tell you uh, that you are in danger. Otherwise, you are all good. You can use Sneak, which is a it has it's a not open source, but it's free. So it tells you for all your dependencies that the RCV is associated. And there is also retard.js, which is what it was the, the most old school one of the, of the tree. Going next, we have security misconfiguration. So when we set up our environments, we, we have databases, CI, CD, we have a lot of um, passwords and users to manage. But uh, we have to change the default configurations and we have to use a username and passwords that are uh, actually strong and not vulnerable. Because if you use like admin admin, this is what your application looks like. This is the security of your application. We are not protecting anything. For example, uh, like when one of, the, I, I work on Fastify and they do a lot of um, patches on Fastify and most of the time they are about cookies and sessions. Cookie is one of the most example of uh, very easy to forget uh, about security configuration. So you always want to uh, sign your cookies and use HTTP only flag. You don't want to forget to uh, implement these security features to the cookies in your web application. So going next, uh, we have remediation. So as I said, different credential should be used in uh, each environment. You want to automate the creation of your environment. You want to use like tools like uh, Terraform, Ansible, for example, because they make the environment repeatable, and this means it's also testable, because every uh, environment where you deploy your application is the same 
as the, the previous one, and this helps a lot with uh, testability and uh, like rep repeatability of testing or like everything gets more predictable, so it's easier. It's easier to test and to verify configuration. You, like we don't do that often, but we want to add tests to make sure that the security configuration are um, actually working. For example, with cookies, you want to have a test in your application that checks if cookies cannot be tampered and your application actually rejects them. Going forth to the fourth place, we have insecure design. Insecure design is also a general concept. It's not a vulnerability per se. It's basically the lack of security control in your architecture. Like your uh, software architecture is missing some security features that uh, are in, that allow potential attackers. Like this is uh, like a meme that I found funny because like we always have some we have to make pillars uh, of, on our web application, and these pillars, one of them is security. Like security is, uh, is something that you have to keep in consideration when building your architecture, and it's not something that you assert after you're being attacked. This is something you want to think about before, because then it's too late, and your data has been leaked, or your database has been canceled, and then it means that you lose money. So how to prevent this? Uh, you want to have model threat. Like we do this in Node.js. Um, we know how to handle uh, possible uh, security vulnerabilities or like uh, how to handle situations and what we, ha we do to prevent being attacked. Uh, you want to use unit tests and integration tests to verify the threat model. So first you say, okay, this is what the potential threats to my application are, and then you add test and verify that your application is not vulnerable to those threats that you identified. And this is not something that you do once and then you say, okay, like I'm done. No, you have to do this uh, quite often because the software development cycle is something that continues. So you always add new libraries, new dependencies, you change your architecture. So you want to, have, want to always want to reevaluate things and change things and improve them with time. Now we start to get to the top three and like they start to get the, the most juicy ones and probably you are more familiar with them. And at third place we have injection. I think injection is my favorite one because it's allow, like, it allows you to do almost anything and it, like, the attacker has to have some kind of um, like a fantasy to write the queries for SQL injection. So it's something that always, uh, like, I found it interesting. And an injection is basically when someone in, injects a malicious payload into your query or your code and so your application is executing someone else's code or doing someone something that someone else has uh, added in a payload. Let's have an example. This is the most like, common example when you have your SQL queries and you just uh, concat uh, user supplied data. And for example, you um, add the name to that query, the variable name, but you are not actually checking that variable is a name. So an attacker could sneak almost anything. Um, like it looks something like this. Like you are not actually checking what the user supplied, just accepting everything, and it's you could accept something like this. Like this is the most common SQL injection that is basically on every book. One equals one, or it means give me everything on that uh, table or uh, column. So depending on your query. And this is uh, very common, uh, especially like if, the, um, if you are using a query parameter and adding it directly into the query without checking or using SQL templating. So how do you prevent this? Validate user input. 
Most of the vulnerabilities that we saw here is because we don't validate user input. Never ever trust what the user supplies. Always check and never use blacklisting. Always use whitelisting so uh, you always have um, like positive checking and not negative. Escape special characters. So um, this is also very common with HTTP smuggling too. So sometimes uh, attackers uh, try to add characters that are not recognized by your, by your application and go into uh, weird edge cases. And with that, they can try to uh, access information or perform malicious operation. You always want to escape special characters and check that uh, they are uh, sanitized. And also avoid user supplied table names or columns. When you create your queries, you want to define on which table you are querying. You don't want the user to supply or, for example, like you have on your URL products and you go on the table products. Like that's something that you want to avoid at all costs because user um, table names or columns cannot be escaped. So that's uh, a thing that you have to keep in mind when building your uh, application. On the second place, we have cryptographic failures. And this is also a general one. So basically using a weak or not even using a cryptographic algorithm. And the most famous example of this is MD5. Don't use MD5 because it has been uh, compromised a long time ago. So if you're, for example, if you hash your table, your passwords on the database with MD5, and for some reason they are leaked, they could be um, like the, the original password can be uh, reconstructed because there are some, actually there are, you can just Google it, tools that do the conversion and the decryption. So you want to use uh, up-to-date and strong uh, algorithms. You want to always, uh, for example, the a very common one is Bcrypt that uses a salt. So that allows that when you hash your when you uh, actually encrypt your your passwords, it's uh, impossible to for an attacker to uh, go to the original password. Use proper key secret management. How many of you pushed some kind of passwords on GitHub, like some like some configuration file, some sensitive information? Like that's something that happen like could happen but uh, you want to have proper k configuration management you want to use like environment 5 and not put everything into your source code and you want to also uh, disable caching for uh, data that contains sensitive information because um, like cache it's something that could also uh, be attacked or it could leak so if you're caching uh, information that are sensible, that's another way uh, an attacker could possibly access this information. And on the first place, we have broken access control. So this one is the most common, by far, vulnerability of web application. So it's when a user can access or perform actions that they are not supposed or should be able to. It means that your API are not protected properly or they do not check uh, who's actually performing that action. So an example could be um, when you check that, you have a, that the user has a token, but you don't check who actually is, in, is the user. So you just check the presence of the token, but you don't actually try to uh, identify the user and authenticate him. And so uh, for in this example, a user could access someone else's uh, data just because they are logged in. And this is very common and this is the, it's uh, been stable on the OWASP top 10 for a few years. Um, and like uh, we get, Vulnerabilities like this all the time, even from uh, like big companies, because it's very hard to protect all your resources. So, how do you prevent this? 
deny by default. Like you want to deny access to your resources unless the, the, a specific condition is met. You don't want to do the opposite. Implement access control just once. You don't want to have multiple uh, access control system. You just want one and you want to use it for all your application. Because if you use multiple access control system, it's easier to have uh, failures of to forget to check something. And also tokens should be short lived. So if you use J JWT tokens, you don't want them to last like forever. Because if, you, if the token somehow is leaked, then everybody can do the same action uh, without being authenticated. So you want tokens to be short lived, you want to do them last as, uh, li as little as possible in order to prevent them, uh, even if an attacker gets a token, he cannot do much because he has a very short time window. And as we said before, you want to log access control failures. As you see, this has been repeated towards the whole top 10 because uh, it allows uh, more vulnerabilities to come in. If you don't log, if you don't manage who's accessing your resources, you have broken access control, identity uh, failures. So everything, all, like all these vulnerabilities are connected to each other. And I think that was it for today. Thanks for listening. You can find my socials there. And thank you.